Okay, so in the previous uh, class, we were talking about various properties of uh, Fourier transform. Uh, we talked about convolution, and then we talked about multiplicative property for Fourier transform, right? So uh, the important takeaway from the previous class was convolution of two time signals is, so uh, convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain, multiplication in time domain is convolution in Fourier domain. That was the, the gist of a previous lecture. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about, uh, going back to the linear systems case, we want to talk about linear systems and Fourier transform. Right, and I want to remind you of the figure Actually, I should say linear TI system, linear time invariant system. So if I give it an input e raised to j omega t, the output would be h of j omega e raised to j omega t. I think this was uh, discussed long time back. I just want to make sure my expressions are correct. Yeah. Okay. So it is correct. This was called the frequency response of the LTI system. So the frequency response is this function h, which is a function of j omega. And that is given by this expression. And it satisfies the following property that when you input an exponentially exponential signal, a periodic signal, then the output is also an exponential periodic signal, but it gets amplified by h of j omega. So that was one thing we had talked about uh, maybe like a couple of weeks back or maybe uh, three weeks three weeks ago. And there was another thing we learned, which is how to compute H of J omega, how to compute the frequency response. So let me uh, reiterate, redo the entire thing again from scratch for a general linear system. So in general, a linear system would be given by an LTI system, would be given by a differential equation This is the differential equation for the linear system. And my goal for the next 15 to 20 minutes are as follows. Number one, I want to compute H of J omega and number two, I want to compute H of T, the impulse response of the system, of the LTI system. Okay, we did this in the previous class. Oh, I think I screwed up. OK, 
Okay, anyways, this is the last page. Okay, so in the previous lecture, let me just go back to the previous lecture. We did that uh, for a specific system. So this was my h of j omega, x of j omega. And we went through the derivation of how to compute y of j omega. So we'll do the same thing today in order to compute the impulse response of the system. That's my goal. So let's go back, go to computing, computation of h of j omega. So what do you think is a recipe for computing h of j omega? What should we do? Let me remind you of the differential equation. and my goal is to compute h of j omega. How do I do that? Let me remind you. You, x of you need to make a... Sorry? Do you need to make a Fourier transform? Uh, differential equation? So, Oh, actually, you are right. I could do that. Yeah, I could take the Fourier transform of both the sides for sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's a good idea. Uh, I was actually looking for another another method, which is just substitute y of t and x of t on these sides of the differential equation, and we'll get h of j omega as a byproduct. So let's do it both ways. Let's do it the way uh, one of your classmates mentioned. That's one way to do it, which is to take the Fourier transform of both the sides. Um, and the other way is just to substitute X of T and Y of T in this particular expression to get H of J omega. So let's try the method given in the book first. No, let's let's try both the methods. Okay, so the, the method, um, that we had discussed earlier, we just substituted on both the sides and we got some expression. And then there is another method in the book by taking the Fourier transform of both the sides. So in the first method, I have to take a k and then dk over dtk h of j omega e raised to j omega t equals to summation bk tk over what do i get what's the kth derivative of h of j omega multiplied by e raised to j omega t Yeah, someone wants to try. E j omega t. Would it just be the, the e to the power? Sorry, can you say that again, Mason? Because. Yeah, there should be a j omega raised to k. Come back uh, as that plus omega e. Or yeah, that too. Yeah, OK. And the same thing will happen on the right side as well. I'll have BK J omega raised to K E raised to J omega T. Okay. So let's look at these terms. So BK J omega K depends on K. So it should be inside the summation. This term 
e raised to j omega t gets cancelled with e raised to j omega t on the other side and in on the other side a k depends on k and j omega raised to k depends on k h of j omega turns out to be a constant so this means i can take h of j omega out i have summation a k j omega raised to k equals to summation b k j omega raised to k and i simply get this is one way to compute h of j omega and this is the method we had introduced in one of the earlier classes perhaps 3 or 4 weeks 2 or 3 weeks ago okay any question on this method fairly straightforward method all right let's look at the second method that i think uh, one of your classmates kono mentioned he basically said let's take the fourier transform of both the sides now i know that fourier transform is linear so what i get is summation ak fourier transform of summation bk fourier transform of where we are using the linearity property of fourier transform this property was discussed in lecture 17 let me not miss out on these k values now let's go back to lecture 17 i'll just uh, look at what's the fourier transform of derivative so we talked about linearity differentiation and integration okay so here is the result i'm looking for so dx over dt the fourier transform is j omega multiplied by the fourier transform of x okay this is the equation i am referring to so the fourier transform of derivative is j omega multiplied by the fourier transform of the original signal let's use that here oh i have a problem so this is the kth derivative so what should i do raise jw to the power of k j omega raised to power k and then i have y of j omega 
equals to BK J omega raised to K X of J omega. Now I realize that my H of J omega is supposed to be Y of J omega over X of J omega. And again, these, this is constant, this is constant, doesn't depend on K, so I can take it out of the summation, move things around, and with a straightforward calculation, I get summation. And lo and behold, we get the frequency response of the system using the coefficients of the differential equation. Any questions so far? Let us go back to the linear systems case. So if I wanted to find the frequency response from this method, the method of computing the impulse response of the system first and then taking the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Turns out that it's very complicated because I first have to solve a differential equation and then I have to take a Fourier transform. So very complicated. On the other hand, if I'm given the LTI system in the form of a differential equation, um, turns out that H of J omega can be just simply by looking at the uh, coefficients of the differential equation, I can compute the H of J omega directly. It, it's actually a brainless activity. Let me actually write it. Note, computing H of J omega from differential equation is a brainless activity. Okay. I know the coefficients of the ordinary differential equation. I just plug it into this formula and I get H of J omega. I don't have to compute any solution to the differential equation at all. Okay. So wait, you're, you're saying that the method of taking the, the capital Y J omega over X of J omega is, is the brainless method or the easy method? No, this is, so I'm saying that once you know the differential equation, this is the differential yeah. equation, right? So once you know right. the differential equation, you just have to plug in the BK, the values of BK and JK in this uh, formula for H of J omega and you get H of uh. Okay. Yeah, that's the brainless part. Right? The brainy part, so let me remind you, the brainy part is to solve the differential equation to compute H of tau, and then take a Fourier transform, which is evaluating this integral. That's the brainy part. That takes a lot of brain power, and you will probably spend two hours in getting the solution right. Uh, getting the value of H of J omega right, okay? Because Many a times you will make some mistakes in the integration or computation of the solution to the differential equation. So you have to go back, correct it, and then get the final expression for H of J omega. That's the brainy activity. The brainless activity is you plug in the coefficient and you get a 
rational fraction of omega, which is uh, h of j omega, the frequency response of the system. Now, the second question we had was, how do you compute the impulse response of the system? Now, again, there was a differential equation method for computing the impulse response using the homogeneous and particular solution approach. And we had discussed it, I think, in lecture six or seven. Um, and it was, it was a laborious method for computing H of T. Now let's look at how do we compute H of T using the approach uh, of uh, what we discussed uh, you know, two minutes ago. So I have H of J omega through a brainless approach. What do I do next? I want to compute H of T. So I want to get to H of T. So let me remind you, let me go back to lecture eight. So I wanted to compute the Y of J omega. What did I do? I wanted to compute Y of J omega and I used partial fractions, right? I computed the expression for Y of J omega and then I, I applied the partial fraction approach. So that's the thing I'm going to do. I'm using partial fraction to get H of J omega equals summation AK over J omega plus, no, uh, actually AK and BKs are used. Let me use CK over DK. K equals zero to capital N. Okay, so I, I, I write H of J omega using partial fraction in this particular method. And then I take the inverse Fourier transform using the table. Uh, I'm of course going to give you the table for assignment. Right now I don't have the table, but uh, it's very similar to the Fourier series table that you had you have already seen before. Okay, so that's it. It's it's so part so this computing this H of J omega is let's say ODE. Going from ODE to H of J omega is fairly simple and straightforward going from H of J omega to the partial fraction, again, fairly straightforward approach. Uh, you need to compute the roots of the denominator, uh, which you can use MATLAB or whatever other tools you have at your disposal to compute the roots, and then uh, use the partial fraction approach. And then you use inverse Fourier transform using table to get the value of H of T. So overall, this whole approach is straightforward approach for computing. for computing the impulse response of the system rather than solving the differential equation approach. Now, of course, some people are good at solving differential equation. They like that better, um, but, but some people would prefer this approach because it's, uh, if you have made a mistake in the process, it's very easy to backtrack and correct for those mistakes. Okay, so let's look at an example. Everyone, everyone follows so far? Any questions? Of course, no matter which approach you pick, you get the, you get the correct answer as long as all your calculations are correct. So you, you know, it's just a matter of getting to the answer quickly rather than through laborious methodology. So here is my differential equation.
this is my ODE. Okay, so what is my h of j omega equal to? Who wants to give it a shot? Would it be uh, the top two plus j omega? And plus. then the bottom, yeah, uh, three plus four j omega plus j omega squared. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so I now know that h of j omega, let me just uh, draw some lines. So this two appears here, this dx over dt converts itself into j omega this three appears here, this four appears here, the second derivative becomes j omega square. Okay. Now I need to compute the partial fraction of h of j omega. So this is going to take some effort. That's the only part which will take, which will require some effort. So Let's do it in a separate page. So I have my h of j omega equals to two plus j omega over three plus. What are the roots of the denominator? So let's look at the denominator. Three plus four x plus or should I use x? Uh, no, x is already used. x, y, z, u, okay. u is not used so far, yeah, okay. u square. So this is my characteristic polynomial of h of j omega. It's called characteristic polynomial, but we don't have to worry about it. Just Let's just write it as denominator. So the denominator is three plus four u plus u square. I need to find the roots of this equation. What are the roots of this quadratic polynomial? Someone? Yeah. Negative one and negative three. Negative one and negative three. Oh, you gave me the right answer. Uh, how do you find how do you find these roots? You can factor it. So you can do u plus three and then u plus one. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, you can factor it, of course, but this is, uh, and this gives you the roots of the denominator, but uh, for quadratic polynomials, there is this formula, which I guess you all are aware of. It's minus four, let me write it, minus B plus minus square root uh, over two A. Right, so this is minus four plus minus square root 16 minus four multiplied by three multiplied by one over two. That's the typical method for computing the roots for a second order polynomial. So this of course is uh, for quadratic polynomials. Sometimes you can do it by inspection as your classmate just did, but uh, many a times it's very difficult to do it by inspection. So you have to use this formula to get the roots of second degree polynomial. For higher degrees, you have to use computer. You, you can't find it by hand unless you can find it by inspection, which as I mentioned is typically difficult. Okay, so I found the roots of the denominator. 
Any question so far? Okay, so now my h of j omega, which is j omega plus two over three plus four j omega plus j omega square. This is a over j omega plus one plus b over j omega plus three. Now, after some computation, we get A equals to B equals to one half. Just for my, my own sake of a quick reminder here, we have A and B, and it's only A and B, and we don't have a C or D because we only have two roots. Oh, uh, that's right. You only have two roots. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay, so I got A equals to half and B equals to half. So I got the partial fraction expansion for H of J omega. Uh, you know, the details of this computation was done in the previous class, so I don't want to reiterate that. Uh, so you get A equals to one half, B equals to one half. So let's plug it in here in the partial fraction approach. I have H of J omega equals to one half, one over j omega plus one plus one half one over j omega plus three. Now I use the linearity of inverse Fourier transform to compute the IFT for the h of j omega and that's equal to Okay, so this is the entire uh, methodology to compute the impulse response for a system. Now, if you have the same approach, but now you have X of J omega, which means that X is not a impulse function, X is some other uh, exponential signal, then you can use the same approach. And let me just write down what the approach is. You go from ODE to H of J omega. Then from H of J omega, you compute Y of J omega, which is H of J omega multiplied by X of J omega. And from here, you do the partial fraction to get Y of J omega equals to a over something plus B over something plus C over something and all that. And from here, you do the inverse Fourier transform to get Y of T equals to A something plus B something plus C something and so on.
notice that if x is an impulse function, then x of j omega equals to one for all omega. So that's why um, the above methodology worked for computing the impulse response. Any question with this approach? Okay. So what did we learn so far? So the first thing we of course learned about the Fourier series, Fourier, uh, Fourier transform. But why is Fourier transform useful? Well, it allows us to solve ODEs using simple algebra. And why, why were we able to solve ODEs using simple algebra? Well, the reason is because of the convolution result. I mean, I mean, it's not just convolution, it's convolution plus linearity plus differentiation plus a lot of whole lot of other uh, good properties that Fourier transform enjoys. And because all those properties are enjoyed by Fourier transform, you can actually uh, solve ordinary differential equations using some simple algebraic manipulations. And this simple algebra basically is just the partial fraction approach. Okay, that's the biggest takeaway from the theory of Fourier transform that we have spent so much time developing. Any question so far? Okay. Now let's talk about the discrete time Fourier transform. So we were talking about continuous time Fourier transform. Now we'll talk about discrete time Fourier transform. Now let's go back to the continuous time Fourier transform problem. And uh, I'm going to, so this is lecture 16. This is beginning of lecture 16. And we were talking about continuous time Fourier transform. And the biggest takeaway from the discussion was that if XT is periodic, then it's sum of complex harmonically related complex exponential. But what about a periodic XT? And for a periodic XT, we realize that it can be converted into a periodic signal with very large period, right? So any a periodic signal can be viewed as a periodic signal with period infinity, right? So this was the obvious result we had um, come across in, in our discussion for Fourier transform. We are going to mimic exactly the same step in today's lecture for discrete time Fourier transform. Okay, so we'll view uh, a periodic signal in discrete time as a periodic signal with infinite period. So view a periodic discrete time signal as periodic signal with periodicity infinity. So let's see what we get. This is my small n. This is my time axis. And I have a signal uh, 
that's it so this is my signal minus two minus one zero one two three and it's zero everywhere else zero this is an aperiodic signal and the it's not just aperiodic but it has finite support which means that it's zero everywhere else except for a finite number of points this is my x of t sorry x of n now let me transform it into a periodic signal with very large period here is my n and so on and this would be my x tilde capital n n which converges to x of n as capital n goes to infinity So I started with an aperiodic signal. I don't know how to take the Fourier transform of aperiodic signal. I have studied the Fourier series analysis for periodic signals, but not for aperiodic signals. Uh, but I want to get there. So what should I do? Well, I'm just going to keep repeating this aperiodic signal over and over again uh, after a long time. Okay, so then I make a periodic signal out of this aperiodic signal. Okay, now I know that I, I have this following result that as capital N goes to infinity, as the periodicity goes to infinity, my periodic signal collapses to the aperiodic signal that I started with, which is really cool, okay? Now, for this periodic signal, X tilde of capital N, I know exactly how to compute the Fourier series. So let's try and compute the Fourier series. Any questions so far? Before we jump on to computing Fourier series. Okay, we are just going to mimic the same steps we did for continuous time Fourier transform. Think of it as a revision for continuous time Fourier transform. So, here is the Let me write omega naught. Omega naught equals to two pi over capital N. So this is the Fourier series uh, coefficients. AKs are Fourier series coefficients. And then you can recover X tilde capital N of N from AK as
Okay. I'm going to concentrate on this particular e expression, this expression. And I'm going to be cognizant of the fact that as capital N goes to infinity, my omega naught would go to zero. So N goes to infinity if and only if omega naught goes to zero. Any questions so far? Can you scroll just a little back up so I can finish yeah. writing down the X of N? Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Okay, now we know that x tilde of n, let's say my, this length n is actually minus n1, uh, minus n1 plus one, minus one, zero, one, two, n2. And this capital N is actually n2 plus n1 plus one. And in this case, my x tilde n is equal to x n for all n minus n1 less than equal to n less than equal to n2. So I can pick any n consecutive time steps for computing this summation. I am uh, arbitrarily picking minus n1 to n2 as the n consecutive steps for summation. And within this interval, I'm just, I just want to make sure that my x tilde of capital N is equal to x within this interval. Okay, going back to the previous uh, figure, this is my cap minus N1, and this would be my plus N2. And within this interval, maybe not this one here. And within this interval, X tilde N is equal to X of N. So I get from this expression, I conclude that AK is equal to one over N summation N equals to minus N1 to capital N2, XN e raised to minus JK omega naught N. Now I know that my X of N has finite support. So I can let N go to, the, the summation is the same as, because X of N is equal to zero outside of minus N1 to N2 interval.
So I look at this expression in the box. I'm going to give it a name. Capital X e raised to J omega, which is summation. N equals minus infinity to infinity. X n e raised to minus J k omega n. No, uh, J omega n. Okay, so I get my, so from this, I can conclude that my AK is given by one over N one over N capital X of E raised to JK Omega naught. I just want to draw a box around this capital X definition. Now from here, I conclude. So remember that this capital X only depends on X. It doesn't depend on X tilde, right? So let's try to get X tilde of N using this value of AK, it's actually given by Now, where does this equation comes from? This equation comes from here. Sorry, I have to scroll a little bit. Here. Now I have to take the limit capital N goes to infinity. And I have the issue that as capital N goes to infinity, uh, omega naught also goes to zero. So there are two terms uh, where the limit will affect. One is uh, with respect to omega naught, the other one is with respect to capital N. So let me get everything within the omega naught format because N equals to well, one over n equals to omega naught over two pi. So from there, one over two pi, I will just write it outside. X e raised to jk omega naught e raised to jk omega naught n omega naught. And now I can let omega not go to zero. On the right hand side, I will, or the left hand side, I have x tilde n converging to xn. And on the right hand side, I'll have the integral because this is the integral expression. And that expression is given by integral over two pi, any two pi interval, x e raised to j omega, e raised to j omega n d omega. And this becomes the Fourier inverse Fourier transform for a periodic signal. So that's all I have for today. And uh, we'll continue our discussion on uh, the Fourier discrete time Fourier transform in the next class. 
uh, I'll stick around if you have any questions. For the 